very warm welcome. Today we are here to uh, remember a great economist, a wonderful teacher, and a fine humanist, Professor C.T. Korean. Uh, before I say, uh, you know, go any further, I would just like to request everyone to switch their uh, phones on the, in the silent mode, if possible, please. I would just like to say a few words about uh, Professor C.T. Korean, who was my teacher in the Madras Christian College in the 1970s, uh, where I did my BA and MA in economics. And I remember right in the beginning, somewhere uh, six months down the line, he asked me to do a review of uh, Paul Sweezy and uh, Paul Baran's book, Monopoly Capital. And I'm sure I did a terrible job of it. But uh, Dr. Kurian was so very kind. I made a lot of mistakes. And he corrected me. Uh, he pointed out all my mistakes very gently. And uh, I never forgot, uh, you know, uh, uh, he was such a fine teacher that I've never forgotten. I've never, I've never made those mistakes again. Much later, um, when I finished my doctorate and I came back to India to do my postdoctoral research, uh, in 93, 95, I was uh, uh, at MIDS, and that is the time when Professor Kurian, in fact, I was working on uh, philosopher John Rawls, and Professor Kurian told me not to get obsessed with just one philosopher, but to look at a wide range of philosophies and to have a critical lens about uh, John Rawls himself. And he also asked me, because one of my interests was secularism, and he asked me to work on a book on secularism that would appeal to young readers. And I'm very happy to say that I was able to follow both those suggestions later on uh, in my life. And uh, I remember him also with a great deal of respect and with affection. And I have no doubt that the other speakers today will also remember them, remember Dr. Korean with a great deal of affection and respect. Uh, may I invite uh, the speakers today? May I invite Mr. Ram, N. Ram? Mr. Uh, Dr. Suresh Babu, Dr. Jairanjan, uh, Dr. Selvaraj, and uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. A.R. Venkata Chalapati is here. Yeah, please take your seats. Thank you. Uh, we will begin this evening with a recording by Dr. V.K. Ram Ramachandran, Vice Chairperson, Kerala State Planning Board. This is a video. Thank you. We have gathered together today to mourn the death and to celebrate the life of C.T. Kurian, an economist and scholar of great distinction and social conscience, and surely one of South India's finest and most influential teachers of economics. I was privileged to be one of his students. The young CTK's entry into economics was inspired by an often neglected part of the Tryst with Destiny speech, where Jawaharlal Nehru says that the service of India means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. 
the schoolboy, CTK, then started his study of economics in the hope that he would be able to understand the causes of poverty and to contribute to, it, to its eradication. CTK's early years in, as a lecturer in the Midlands Christian College were marked by what he calls a restlessness, a restlessness uh, that, that came from the disjunction between theory and real life issues in economics. This was a general dissatisfaction. This was a, a dissatisfaction that was felt by econ many economists. Amartya Sen once wrote that because in some ways economic problems are more serious, more nasty in India than they are in many, in many other parts of the world, the comparative failure of standard economics to, to deliver the goods would be noticed more sharply in India. And so it was to CT, with CTK. CTK went to uh, Stanford for his PhD in order to try and equip himself theoretically to understand the economic problems of India. There is a, a, a lot being written on this and I would urge anyone who is interested in this phase of CTK's life and, uh, and the kind of intellectual ferment that was going on in, in Stanford at the time to read CTK's writing. At the end of his stay, uh, having, having engaged with neoclassical economics, with, uh, with Kenneth Arrow, with the work of Koopmans, and also with the surplus labor theorists, CTK began to, came to the... He believed that he had developed an alternative, that he was able... that he was dissatisfied with neoclassical economics, he was uh, unconvinced by the explanations of the surplus labor theorists. And he believes that his alternative, in his alternative, he was able to show that the distribution of non-labor resources was the essence of understanding India's economy and its problems. In teaching undergraduate uh, courses, CTK wrote, I maintained that three related questions were required to understand an economy. <clears throat> who owns what, who does what, and who gets what. Uh, and this was the principles, principle that he applied to his teaching of economics when he came, came back to, to uh, MCC, to the Madras Christian College. I had the good fortune of being a student in CTK's Indian Economic Problems, or, or IEP class, in 1969-72. What CTK's course did was to teach us to use economic theory to sort of create a toolbox with which to examine and analyze specific problems and a very wide range of problems of the, of the Indian economy. He helped us study a very wide range of sectors, agriculture, livestock, industry, the informal sector, banking, major services, marketing and trade plan models, the public sector, and much more, using these conceptual tool, tools that we had in the, in the toolbox that he had helped us build. Uh, this, for me, it's, of course, it's the foundation of my knowledge of the Indian economy. And uh, what constituted a BA course in, econ in Indian economic problems was also, for CTK, a work in progress. He was clear about about uh, the exams. He gave us a textbook, a rather good textbook, and said, learn what's in the textbook and you'll do well in your exams. Now let's, now let's really study the, the Indian economic problems. Uh, I remember an occasion when I was back from a day at a workers' strike. It was then at what was then Madhavaram Milk Colony. The specific issue was that the government, in order to break the strike, was using police personnel and prisoners from the local jail to milk the cattle. The union said that this violated ILO conventions to which India, India was signatory. And uh, by the way, uh, around that time, India's president had been in the news for a trip, that's Vivi Giri, that he had made to the ILO where he spoke of India's links with the organization. In any case, I decided to make a statement of protest against this in the Indian Economic 
uh, Indian economics problem class. I asked CTK permission to do so. He said, he asked why he would let, why would I let you do that? And I said, because it is an Indian economic problem. He thought long, told me he'd tell me the next morning. I mean, I'd have made the statement anyway. I think he knew that. The, the next morning, after having consulted his conscience and thought about it, CTK let me go ahead. Um, year, this, this years ago, I discovered that this period was also a turning point in CTK's understanding of the economy. In 2019, when I once wrote to him of how his classes on the Indian economy kept returning to me, he wrote uh, that it was my way, that course of 1969 to 72, he wrote, was my way of showing my protest against the teaching of neoclassical economics as the economic theory. Yes, that course and the years and those years were decisive in my professional career. Uh, I must note that CTK, at the, during that period, towards the end of his stay in, uh, in Madras Christian College, proposed a rural employment guarantee scheme in the form of a land army, what he called land army, for India. The first person, as far as I know, to have done so. In 2021, on the occasion of CTK's 90th birth, birthday, the Chief Minister of Kerala, paying tribute to a person who, who he called a consistent supporter of policies that, uh, that benefit the vast majority of people, drew per particular attention to the fact that CTK had been an early advocate of a rural employment guarantee. In 1978, CTK took the very major decision to leave the Madras Christian College to become the founder director of the uh, MIDS. I note, I'm sure that that phase of CTK's life is going to be discussed in detail in this meeting. I see uh, many of the people here, many people here who knew about that phase, and uh, including, uh, I also see the young, I also see the, uh, the name of the young new director of MIDS on the list. So I will not go to that in any detail. but. Uh, let me just say that I, CTK's work at that time, sort of dividing the MCC period and the, uh, at, and the MIDS period, a very important work at that time, certainly important for me, was CTK's book on the dynamics of rural transformation in, uh, uh, it was called a Dynamics of Rural Transformation, a study of Tamil Nadu, 1950 to 19, 1975. This was an, an ins it was very important, it was an important book, it was important for me. It was an incisive analysis of the new dynamism that rural areas had experienced over the qu quarter century that CDK covered, a dynamism unknown in previous history. It was uh, recently at a condolence meeting for CTK organized by the Center for Development Studies and the Gulati Institute in Tirvanandapuram, uh, R.S. Deshpande said that the last chapter, if you are interested in the study of rural India, the last chapter of this book should be compulsory reading. CTK also helped during the, uh, during the uh, MIDS period, he also really reached out to other institutions in Tamil Nadu and in different states of South India trying to get more and more people to work on problems of poverty and to work, so work on problems, similar, conduct similar studies of rural transformation. The, I have been, I've been using CTK's uh, work in recent months for a book, for the introduction to a book on uh, economic change in the lower Kaveri Delta, which we've recently published. And the, I found that I found that CTK's description of the limits to success that uh, that the path of growth without structural change, his phrase, has had with respect to economic development, employment, and the reduction of social and economic 
uh, inequality are extremely important uh, areas of study. At the end of his book, CTK wrote, what are the social and economic forces that enable the few who are rich to benefit from all the measures undertaken for the improvement of society as a whole? And what are the socio-economic forces that prevent the many who are poor from taking advantage of even those measures specifically designed for them? This is the clue to the understanding of rural transformation. Uh, uh, wise words still relevant. When CTK taught his Indian economy course, a question that he asked when we began and ended was, what is the major problem of the Indian economy today? And he was in no doubt about the answer. It was the poverty and deprivation of hundreds of millions of people in our society. Let me say that listening to him then, as a teenager, never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that addressing students of the Indian economy 50 years on and asking them the same question, what is the major problem of the Indian economy today? I would have had to reply that hundreds of millions of people in our country continue to live in conditions of income poverty, undernutrition and deprivation, subject to avoidable disease, deprived of free and universal education, and subject to the worst forms of class, caste and gender oppression on this planet. The world is truly a poorer place for the death of people like CTK. Those who help us identify poverty and its social and economic characteristics and inspire us to come together to fight for a just society. Thank you all very much. May I, <clears throat> may I now request uh, uh, Dr. Suresh Babu to say a few words. He is the director of Madras Institute of Development Studies. Um, well, MIDS heard the news of passing away of CTK with great sorrow. But MIDS also decided that day that, you know, we are not going to mourn, but we are going to celebrate CTK's work and CTK's contribution to MIDS. I have not been very fortunate to become the student of, or direct student of CTK, but I had the fortune of becoming his students' students. I've been taught by his students. So in that sense, I am actually his grand student, not a direct student. I also had uh, the fortune or the rare experience of being interviewed by him for an academic position, which actually revealed how you know, grilling he can be when he sits on the other side of the table and how cordial he can be when he sits on this side of the table. So, um, well, so I am not really going to talk about the... Uh, personal warmth as well as the influence which CTK had in terms of uh, mentoring students as well as uh, creating a generation of economists in India. There are three things which for me stands out when we talk about CTK and when we look at his uh, life as a teacher and a scholar. One most important thing which I see which is very relevant for India now is, I think, the importance of having very good undergraduate education. And that CTK was extremely clear after a PhD from Stanford, coming back to impart state-of-art undergraduate education uh, and to create a generation of, you know, uh, youngsters to provoke them to look at the problems of Indian economy from different angles I think is one of the important contributions which uh, we will uh, always be indebted to, to CTK. And I, and I really think it is very important to understand this because when we talk about undergraduate education now, we feel that there is a big void in terms of you know, that rigor as well as the quality 
which CTK used to have when he was imparting uh, the state of art economic theories uh, in MCC. The second important thing which uh, we have to learn as uh, academics from CTK is his ability to impart a uh, kind of courage to question the mainstream. And I think that is also missing in India now, especially uh, as academics, when we train our next generation, we find that you know, we don't equip them in terms of questioning the main, mainstream. We would sometimes see a lot of academic work which uh, goes along with the mainstream taking a position which is closer to the mainstream, or rather I would say playing it safe with the mainstream. But CTK was very different in all these things. And CTK always imparted courage to his students and to his you know, uh, colleagues to question the foundations of so-called mainstream and to provoke alternate thoughts. The third uh, important thing for me when we look at uh, the life and work of CTK is to bring in social reality to economic analysis. Well, quite often, economists, especially in modern times, gets carried, get carried away by the technical sophistication of their economic models. But CTK always reminded us that it is very important to weave in social realities to economic models. Otherwise, these models which you think can explain phenomenons would not be of much use. I would say these three, in fact, you know, were very important when he was conceptualizing and forming the uh, P PhD program at MIDS. Because PhD program in MIDS was, in a way, I'm sure you know, uh, there will be other speakers who would talk about that, in a way was a, a kind of a training to question the mainstream economics and to bring in reality to economic modeling. Now, uh, when I was a PhD student way back in the 90s, CTK wrote this book, Rethinking Economics. And this came out in uh, 95, 96. And when we were students, we thought that you know, rethinking economics would be in light of there then, you know, big bang economic reforms that were happening in India, 91, 92, and, you know, questioning some of those. But this was basically a reflection which was based on his study of Indian economy, of which, you know, Dr. C. K. Ramchandran, v. K. Ramchandran was talking about. He used his Indian economy courses in such a way to reflect on economic theory and then to see whether we could develop alternatives. I will read out just three or four sentences from this book, which uh, I always tell is a compulsory reading for all my students at least. One, CTK writes that, the elegance of neoclassical theoretical stage therefore depends not so much on the characters themselves, but on the elaborate makeup done in the green room. And I think that is very, very profound in the sense of, you know, economic modeling today has reached a stage where, you know, this kind of makeups and cosmetic beautification captures the center stage rather than the social reality. CTK also goes on to look at, you know, some of the things that are extremely relevant. And please remember this was in early 90s. And some of his observations of that time in 2024 assumes very, very, uh, very, very uh, important kind of, you know, dimensions now. Uh, especially his remarks about transnational economy. CTK quotes Peter Drucker and then states that 90% of transnational economies financial transactions do not serve what economists would consider an economic function. They serve purely financial functions. And we are living now in 2024 in a world where finance dominates or finance trumps economics. These money flows have their own rationale, of course, but they are in large part political rationalities, anticipation of government decisions as to central bank interest rates or foreign exchange rates, taxes, 
government deficits, government borrowings, or political risks. So what, what I wanted to highlight is that some of the problems that we are talking now and we are researching now, CTK had insights of that maybe 35 years back in terms of his own observation of Indian economy, rethinking Indian economy from those observations. Two more things and I'll stop. CTK also encouraged the importance of field work, which has a long tradition in MIDS. We are living in a times when we talk about sample sizes in data, how big is your sample and you know, is your sample representative, etc. But CTK never bothered about such you know, size of the sample as it is. CTK wanted to capture the social reality even if it is a smaller sample. And in this book, again, he highlights this importance of you know, going to the field, observing the field, and then reflecting on what is happening into the, in, in the field, into your academic work. Finally, I leave with a personal note, perhaps, what uh, CTK would have left for me in this book. To quote, it was my expectation that directorship of a small institute would provide plenty of spare time for my personal research. When I joined MIDS also, I thought that, you know, it's a small institute and I will have time. But CTK had already experienced it. However, that is not how it turned out. I can understand that. The administrative work was not particularly demanding, but the involvement in building up new institutions, recruiting faculties, drawing up the ground rules, developing the programs, etc., did not give enough opportunity to concentrate on what I wanted to do. Perhaps he could anticipate the whole challenge of institution building and what it means to have robust institutions years back. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Suresh Babu. Now we have uh, Dr. Jairanjan, who is the vice chairman of the Tamil Nadu uh, State Planning Commission. I also happen to be his uh, last uh, PhD student. <clears throat> so unlike uh, Suresh and uh, VK Ramachandran, I am going to recollect my association with CTK as a student, CTK as my teacher and me as his, as his student. I was 22 when I met CTK. That was in 1989. He was the director of MIDS. I had applied for ICSR fellowship to pursue my PhD at MIDS. My schooling and college was uh, predominantly in the hinterland of the state, except for my post-graduation in Madurai Kamaraj University and Madurai was like a large village in the late 1970s. So as a consequence, I could read, write, and speak only in Tamil. As far as English was concerned, I could read and write, but barely speak. PhD entrance examination had three components. A proposal had to be submitted along with the application. Proposals were scrutinized, and the applicants were shortlisted. A written test for the shortlisted applicants was conducted, followed by an interview. I had no difficulty in the written test, and in fact, I managed to score full marks in it. However, in the interview, my performance was pathetic. Malcolm, who was the chairperson at that time, was sitting in the selection panel, put me at ease and offered me that I could respond in Tamil. Out of sheer anxiety, I was adamant and continued with my severely mutilated English. Malcolm, after about 10 minutes, lost his patience. That is, that is his style and he promptly curtailed my interview and threw me out of the room. I was quite certain that I will not be awarded the fellowship due to the language difficulties. However, I was very surprised to receive the selection letter after four days. When I reported to CTK, as he was the director, he told me that I should not worry about English. English is, after all, a language. With some effort, you will easily overcome the difficulty that you have now. Those were the words of encouragement from him. Though I was technically assigned to Dr. Sarajit Majumdar as a research scholar, I was an unsupervised student for a long time, as Dr. Sarajit was away most of the time as he lost his wife in an air crash and had to take care of his toddler son. Eventually, he quit. Meanwhile, CTK had to step in in the shoes of a supervisor to sign the papers for ICSR and the university. After a year or so, he asked me what I am up to. 
Then my response was, sir, nobody tells me what I should do, and my readings have put me in a lot of frustration. His cryptic responses were two. One, he said, frustration is a good sign for a research student. Two, nobody will guide you. You have to charter your own course, and the supervisor's business is to supervise, not to tell you what to do. With the license to charter my own course, I went in all directions that fancied me. My research question kept changing every six months. CTK had the patience to allow me to explore such a wide canvas. Due to my foolish zeal and reckless indulgence, I had to be away from Chennai so as not to be harassed by the police and the intelligence. I went back to my village without informing CTK or MIDS. No one knew where I was, and I remained incommunicado. MSS Pandian, my dear friend, was a postdoctoral fellow at the Calcutta Center at that time. When he came to Chennai for his vacation, he managed to track me down. He advised me to write to CTK about what has happened and also to tell him that he would like to come back to MIDS to pursue my degree. When I wrote to CTK, CTK immediately responded that and said that I could go back to MIDS to continue my PhD, but he put a condition saying that I should not ask for the fellowship, continuation of the fellowship. CTK then asked me whether I would like to be his uh, student form formally. Once that uh, technical process was through, he cautioned me that it was time to finalize my research question. He suggested that I pull out my proposal from the, about the cropping pattern changes in my village and reformulate it in the light of all the eight uh, monthly reports that I, six monthly report that I had written so far at that time. When I did that, it became my research question. I could write the main chapters within a year except the introduction and the conclusion. When I reflect later about why CTK allowed me or encouraged me to wander through the worlds of sociology, anthropology, history, etc., and not insisting that I stick to the traditional development economics, I realized that <coughs> he had a firm conviction that to understand the reality about India, one has to move away from the conventional development economics and neoclassical neo -classic economics. He must have strongly felt the discipline of sociology, anthropology, history are much closer to the Indian reality than the conventional development economics and the neoclassical economics. Whenever I interacted with him, he was very enthusiastic when I moved in the direction of the social embeddedness of the economy. He never pulled me back to my original discipline of mathematical economics in which I had a master's degree. Since then, I had never looked back in all these years. A journey in the group of mathematical economics would have definitely provided me with a much brighter prospects in the job market. But CTK was not a market man. He was a man of idealism. In fact, he suggested that I should go back to some rural area and teach students at least for five years after the completion of my PhD. And I did fulfill his wishes by serving in Pondicherry for five years. He never clamored for any power or money. When the National Front government was in power, both in the Union and in, the, in Pondicherry, I was deputed to find out whether CTK was interested in taking up the vice chancellorship of Pondicherry Central University. When I proposed to him, he steadfastly and straight away rejected the offer. And CTK was never also lured by money. He was of the firm opinion that teachers and researchers were to be paid a decent salary, but not extraordinary sums of money. When I met him after drawing my first salary as a lecturer in Pondicherry, I showed him my pay slip. At that time, lecturers in state universities the colleges were drawing a salary with a basic pay of 600 per month, whereas the pay commission at that time hiked the basic salary of the lecturers to 2,200 per month. My salary was around 2,589. CTK was prophetic. You know what he said? Henceforth, teachers will think only about money and investment, and they will forget about the academic environment, and the environment will de degenerate completely. Now I realize how prophetic he is. On the day of my revival, hours, he hoped that I do not regret the time spent revising the introduction chapter at his insistence. He said, PhD is not an end, and it's only a beginning and a rigorous training. His demand for so many revisions was to give me a good beginning and a training. In hindsight, I realized that that had stood me in good stead for the next 35 years of my academic journey. I have lost my teacher who taught me not only how to be sincere, but also to be a person with values. Thank you, CTK. Your values are your legacy. I'll remember your caution to me one day. He said, Jairanjan, freedom comes with a cost, and that is responsibility. And the last communication that I had was about his happiness. He said, I'm a proud teacher. Two of my students, BK Ramachandran and you, are the heads of the planning commissions of uh, two state governments in the southern state, South, South India. 
And those were his last words I heard from him. And thank you for uh, your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jay Ranjan, for that very moving tribute. Yeah. Uh, we now have a video with uh, Barbara Harris White. Audio, audio. Oh, sorry, it's, a, it's, a, it's an audio with uh, Barbara Harris White. And she is a professor emeritus, University of uh, Oxford. She is also an emeritus fellow of uh, Wolfson College in Oxford. Greetings to you all. I apologize that I will not be joining you either in person or even on Zoom, but I've made this recording. Professor V. K. Ramachandran, Ram to his friends and colleagues, has crafted such a fine tribute to CTK, who was his teacher, that it's quite challenging not to be repetitious. But please allow me to express my gratitude for his notable, long and active life in the following ways. First, while the status of teachers is no longer quite what it was when Professor S. Radhakrishnan could be pictured with his Rolls Royce, some teachers have memorable social and political roles in the life of those they form. CTK was one such. He spent his working lifetime dedicated to critical teaching, which helped to shape minds in the next two generations of applied economists. They were to dissent from the tyranny of neoclassical economics in a variety of ways and in a range of practical fields. But that dissent and teaching that dissent does not make you popular with the economics establishment. CTK was also an institution builder. He arrived in Second Main Road, Gandhinagar in 1978, full of energy to realize and to scale up Malcolm Adisashi's vision. Indeed, Adisatia seemed only too glad to retreat to his office and study in order to compile bulletin after bulletin of penetrating reflections on the current affairs of Tamil Nadu. He left the appointment of staff across the scope of the new thematic discipline of development studies, the recruitment of apprentice scholars, the welcome to foreign researchers, the management of the night watch and the sundry care of bottle tops and tap washers to CTK's very capable hands. At the same time over these years, CTK could carry out, manage and publish a significant body of research. This has been ably appreciated by Ram. Yes to his critique of economic theory and political economy. Yes to his gnawing and unassuageable concern about poverty and other dimensions of deprivation. Yes to an early concern about the environment and yes to his vision for robust planning and public policy. But I'd like to dwell briefly here on a way of looking at development which had a long-standing effect on my own work. It was introduced in his book about regions with Joseph James called Economic Change in Tamil Nadu, which came out in 1979. What is a region? A state of India with its definite frontiers? A data container? A physical, agroecological landscape? an urban port hinterland, a language zone, a transport coefficient in a regression model, a geography, a cultural and civilizational space, the lived spaces of capital, or even a non-question in a world penetrated by the boring logic of market exchange. Unusually for economists, CTK and Joe James launched their empirical study of regions from the general idea that time, space, environment, and social structure were both specific and diverse. They experimented in several ways with the most disaggregated evidence that they could find for Tamil Nadu. They bundled it into four broad dimensions, agriculture, work and labor, the non-farm industrial urban economy, and lastly, population. Then they clustered this mass of variegated data, and they examined how it behaved over time. Inside Tamil Nadu, they discovered distinct development pathways. They were first to identify fast urbanization peculiar to Tamil Nadu, to find small agglomerated towns attracting migrant labor, especially in the rain-fed interiors. 
but much didn't change a lot, especially the composition of the workforce. They found that the non-farm economy was little influenced by local agricultural growth. It tended to be metropolitanized. Now this research was the precursor to an enduringly fascinating body of literature on Tamil Nadu's regions and on Tamil Nadu as a region, ranging from historians such as Chris Baker all the way to MIDS's theorists of the Dravidian model, Bhaskar and Kale Arasan. It was revisited by CTK with Guhan and Vaidyanathan in 1988, and its legacy may well be being felt over four decades later in Cambridge University Press's proposed new book series on regional economies of India. Then, in an era when institutional memories are vanishing, unless they are supportive of the stories behind rock star academics, another memorable trait was CTK's style. As a person, I remember him as measured and conscientious, but with flashes of ironic and occasionally bitter wit. As a writer, he was communicative and clear, as befitted his philosophy of teaching. But last, CTK was the only academic in whose presence the earth moved. Some decades ago, after an evening meal at his Chennai home, home the light swung and blinked and objects gave shudders. It was an earthquake. Metaphorical earthquakes are sometimes associated with people who have died young, with their life work unfinished. But in CTK's case, his earthquake years are over, but I will always remember how calmly he enjoyed my surprise at a real one. Rest calmly in peace, CTK, and thank you. Now, may I invite Mr. N. Ram, who is uh, director of the Hindu Publishing Group and also trustee, Media Development Foundation. Yeah. Mr. N. Ram. This is a solemn occasion, but uh, after mourning the passing of Professor C.T. Korean, we have, as Ramachandran mentioned, every reason to celebrate his life and work. Nothing was wanting in his life, so there should be no regret at uh, what happened recently, other than pay our respects. But before I speak about my interaction and friendship with CTK, let me read out a message sent to me by Professor Vedagiri Shanmugasundaram, who was born on September 16th, 1921, and was uh, CTK's uh, senior. He writes that uh, he thanks the ACJ for organizing this in memoriam for my dear Madras University MCC colleague from 1961, he says that uh, we took our MA in 1948 and 53 and taught for several over six decades in Madras University from 1961. As a president of the Indian Economics Association, Professor Shanmugasundaram took responsibility to elect CTK President IEA in, I'm just reading from that, 2001 at BIT Vellore, and he presided uh, the conference in Trivandrum in 2002. And the message is as follows. He, was, he requested me to read it out today here. He was a tower of strength at the Board of Studies at the University of Madras for over six decades. He had deep fervor for theoretical Indian economics. And the third message is, in his MIDS years, the founder, Dr. Malcolm Adisesia, developed Alfred Marshall's principles and descriptive studies, and as his successor, C.T. Korean moved to Pigou's welfare economics in the context of planning. So both Dr. Adisesia and I valued his planning studies from the 1970s to the 1990s. And this is uh, what he wanted me to 
convey here. I was not a CTK student. I was not uh, studying, reading economics, but I knew him from the time V.K. Ramachandran and also my friend Justice Chandru, who's here, joined that college from around that time. He was, Ramachandran was a student at, at the BA level, at the MA level, and also PhD. And Justice Chandru was a student of botany, but he got to know CTK very well over, over, over the next several decades. I don't want to speak on the economics, except to note that I learned quite a lot from uh, Ramachandran's, as Barbara Harris said, finely crafted article on CTK published in the Hindu about the trajectory of his academic career as an economist of note, how and why he entered economics, the connection with those memorable words in the Trist with De Destiny speech of Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, what he thought about the disjunction between theory and real life issues, why he wanted to study theory, CTK was, it's clear, was deeply interested in economic theory. He did not dodge that. He was not just a development economist in, in, the, in, in that sense. And uh, Ramachandran also, uh, I learned quite a lot about uh, the first steps he took at Stanford University where he enrolled for a doctoral program. And others have said it, Barbara Harris has said it, and the other speakers have brought that out very clearly testing theory by confronting it with the economic problems of India. And testing the claims to universality, I'm quoting from Ramachandran's article of neoclassical economics by applying it to probe the literature on surplus labor. And the alternative that uh, he thought he had worked out and various, uh, they could have various views on it, but uh, it was a notable contribution. You, I certainly knew him as a beloved teacher from the strong bonds forged over decades, they su sustained over decades. He, he was a student who looked up to him. He was no pushover. He was not just soft. Ramachandran used to tell me about uh, how demanding he was as a teacher. And Barbara, speaking about his style, CTK style, says that apart from humor, he had, uh, you know, his wit could be sardonic and even bitter at times when he thought about problem and also a clarity of not just thinking but in communicating. And uh, that I think was very important to him as a teacher. He enforced discipline in class, but as we just heard, uh, somebody who, whose English was certainly not up to what was required, was able to get through and become a notable figure in the social sciences. And both Malcolm and CTK were progressive teachers. They understood the social, socioeconomic background and the cultural background from which students came. And without uh, breaking rules, they actually, without admitting to breaking rules, they actually bent the rules uh, so that uh, somebody who, who's usually denied access to the portals of higher learning is able to sail through with some difficulty. He must have been demanding also. I have no doubt about it. But uh, certainly, as Ramachandran says, one of South India's finest and most influential teachers of economics. All of us remember favorite teachers. For me, it was Kurvilla Jacob, headmaster of the Madras Christian College High School uh, a long time ago. I knew from my own class and other classes in school how they related to him decades later when they'd gone old. How you, how, how you, one teacher comes to mind, one or a few teachers come to mind and uh, CTK was very long lived, was able to sustain that over a very long period and had uh, a lot of students who were grateful in different ways. I thought at one point, uh, talk, 
but Mr. Uh, Professor Suresh Babu, what he said, uh, once you become a director of an institution, particularly an institution that had to be built brick by brick, when I mean, there's nothing before, except that you have a very generous mentor in Malcolm Abhisheshaya, he had to do everything. And often we used to discuss this because C CTK as an economist has a, uh, was very prolific, very productive research, which was published, a very notable body of work. How would he fare as an administrator? Are you not uh, uh, making the wrong choice by making them administrators? Because very often we know that creative people, people who are productive, when they take up these jobs, they confess to you openly, I can do nothing. I can't write, I can't do research, I can't think straight. There's so many problems, there's so much stress. So I think uh, it was good to know uh, from all that uh, I've learned in the last few days how good an administrator he was, uh, and so on. He could be stern. It was not always without controversy. There were people who didn't like what he decided on there. I knew that at that time, but uh, he stuck to the task, and so on. And this great body of published research work, I think, uh, is a very notable contribution. Uh, when he did it uh, as for the most part as director of the MIDS and of course continued later. He was a, I don't think uh, this has been touched upon yet, he was a progressive public intellectual who always spoke out on issues that matter. I remember when we had protests against the Vietnam War, the US war of aggression against Vietnam, uh, very destructive, uh, when we, issued statements, CTK would always readily agree to do it when we approached him. And later on, Iraq and all those issues, he took a very uh, progressive stand. On secularism, he was a lion, he was a champion, and he had thought deeply about it. And I, I, I think we, we can get hold of this note, but I remember a 1990s note he wrote for a seminar in Chennai, organized by uh, a group we, uh, of which I was part called Citizens for a Secular Society, a note he wrote on communalism and the rising threat to secularism in India. And he provided in this note clarity and insight by differentiating secularism as a value as a set of principles enshrined in many texts and covenants, including the Indian Constitution, earlier the US Constitution, between secularism as a set of principles or as a value which you try to put, it to put to work and the process of secularization which takes almost unnoticed or noticed on and off uh, in society, it had already made considerable progress. Ramachandran speaks about the, uh, about the dynamics of rural transformation in um, Tamil Nadu for those 25 years and that uh, very important landmark book that came out of him when he was in MIDS. Likewise, uh, uh, you know, he, he could have easily written the history of the process of secularization in Indian society over the same period, had he time. Equally important, apart from style, he lived a life of simplicity and integrity. And I remember attending a retirement function, I think it was when he was retired as director at MIDS, when he related this experience that he and his wife were traveling on a bus very early, much earlier, some decades earlier perhaps, and he said, this is what we can afford. Are you willing to live this life, the life of the mind, if you like? And she readily agreed to do it, so we have to pay, we have to salute this is C.T. Kurian for going along with this, that decision without which C.T.K. wouldn't be what he was. And I think uh, uh, that simplicity and integrity, both they came together, continued right till the end. And he was a wonderful friend. Uh, I remember when I would call him Professor C.T. CT Kurian, Professor Kurian, he'd say, call me C.T.K., which all his students did as well later on. And uh, he would periodically call and uh, talk about issues. 
And on one occasion, he said, uh, you know, I'd like to read, and I'd like to do book reviews for Frontline. And uh, Ramachandran calls them, his, in, in the article in the Hindu, his Frontline years. He began to do book reviews, meticulously presenting the author's point of view and then commenting on it. And I think those reviews are quite a notable contribution, end of life, uh, towards the end of his life, to uh, uh, serious journalism uh, in, in the form of book reviews. So these are the things I remember about uh, CTK. And as I said earlier, there's nothing to regret. He lived a long life and he was clear till the end. I think Ramachandran and others met him just before that. His, his brother is here, his family is here, and uh, they can vouch for that. Uh, fortunately for him, his mind was very, very clear till the end, and I think he passed away peacefully for the most part. Uh, it must have been easy, so I think we can be grateful for that and also celebrate the life of a very good man who dedicated himself to the life of the mind and also to the service of the non-privileged non millions in India in both uh, country and town. And this is, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Ram. We now have an, an, a video of Professor V.K. Natraj, who was a former director of the Madras Institute of development studies. He was also a trustee of the Malcolm and uh, Elizabeth Adisesia uh, Trust. So we can listen to the video. Memorial event dedicated to Christopher Thomas Korean, whom we all know as CTK. My association with CTK started in the mid or late 1970s mainly through his work. Like any teacher of uh, development which I was, I naturally was familiar with the new lines of thinking which CTK had started introducing. One of the things which attracted me was his emphasis on the composition of growths and a move away from blind emphasis on rates of growth. That was a very appealing thing to many of us in my generation. Later on, of course, when I came to know CTK, I realized why he had come to this position. It has to do something with his disaffection with the way in which economics was being taught. Coming, coming back to chronology, CTK was educated in MCC, Madras Christian College, where, as one would expect, he topped the list. And as is the tradition in that college, he was taken on to the faculty. He soon began to experience a certain discontent. I think mainly it was because economics as it was being taught then was not socially relevant or purposeful. I'm sure I'm not the first one to notice this, but there is a startling similarity between CTK and Dr. Malcolm Adishashaya. Now, Dr. Adishashaya also introduce new methods of teaching economics. And one of the finest tributes to his methodology has come from a very prominent pupil of his, one of our outstanding economists, Professor K. N. Raj. CTK more or less followed in the same trajectory as Dr. Adhashashaya. What CTK did was to first equip himself with extraordinary ability in conventional economics, he also demonstrated the non-universality of the neoclassical paradigm. Then he began to give his attention to issues which dominated his entire life, namely how to serve India in such a way that its poverty and inequality are reduced. He once told me that in his younger days, a book which impressed him most was Minu Masani's Our India. Now, this constant preoccupation with the major problems bedeviling India, 
and this desire to make the study of economics more socially purposeful and relevant are things which dominated his entire adult life. And that is what, personally for me, is one of the greatest attributes of CTK's character. Now, coming back to his work, in his early work, he demonstrated the importance of analyzing the composition of growth. Mere concentration on rates of growth will not do. There's a very good example here to illustrate his commitment to this approach. In the 1970s, he was asked by the government of Tamil Nadu to be part of a team which would come out with a Mahalnobis type model. CTK politely declined saying that he did not believe that increasing rates of growth would automatically lead to a reduction in poverty. And he pursued this line of thinking. He pursued this line of thinking in two different ways. One, he pursued it in terms of his own research. His book, for example, Poverty Planning and Social Transformation, where he comes out very strongly against what he called the arithmomorphic approach, mere insistence on numbers. For some odd reason, I personally think that this book is less often cited and quoted than it should be. So that is one trajectory he followed in terms of research. And he obviously followed this in terms of his teaching. He once told some of us that after a certain point of time, he told his colleagues in MCC that it was no longer possible for him to teach conventional economic theory because he was in disagreement with so much of its fundamental postulates and therefore he started teaching Indian economics. And apparently, he was of course a very influential teacher. I'm also told that his Indian economics classes were full of arguments. And recently, uh, in an obituary reference, uh, Dr. V.K. Ramachandran has uh, drawn attention to the fact that CTK's book, which I mentioned earlier, Planning, Poverty Planning and Social Transformation, is dedicated to his students who were his teachers. Now that brings me to another very important uh, facet of CTK's character. He liked candor. When he was chairman of MIDS, he invited me to consider becoming director of MIDS, which came as a complete surprise to me. That I was familiar with his work should surprise no one, but that I was on CTK's radar. I had met him a few times, but I can't claim to have known him. I was absolutely dumbfounded. I'm very grateful to CTK for giving me what I would call a second lease of life in the academic profession. I can assure you that no director could have wished for a better chairman than CTK. He was always ready to give you advice, but it was unobtrusive. He was never an intrusive director. And when selections had to be made, one of the first things he would do was to ask the director, what kind of personnel are you looking for? That is the kind of generosity which CTK had. Coming to his role as uh, director, when he recruited faculty to the institute, unlike Isaac in Bangalore and CDS in Tiruvananthapuram, CTK did not go for established names. On the contrary, he selected youngsters who had displayed a lot of potential. That all his selections, or most of them, were well-founded is shown by the research record and the output of MRDS even in the early days after he took over as director. That's a great tribute to his institution team building capacities. Then the other thing is his honesty. One example I have already given of virtually refusing to take part in a Mahalnobis like model for Tamil Nadu. The other happened when he was director and the Ford Foundation offered him some assistance and wanted to know what he would like. CTK said that his priority was to increase library space because the library collections were accumulating at a fast pace and there was not enough space. Ford Foundation said, we will not assist you with brick and mortar, but we will train your faculty. 
CTK's response was immediate. He said, thank you, but I prefer to train my faculty myself. That is the kind of candor, almost brutality, if you like, which he had when it came to his fundamental beliefs. Now, as chairman, one other thing I found in him was that he encouraged me always to be very candid with him. Early in my directorship, there was some problem in the institute, not unusual in any organization, and certainly not unusual in an organization with academics. And CTK said, Nataraj, that's when his Malayalam intonation asserted itself, it was never Nataraj, always Nataraj, would you like my help in sorting this out? I said, may I be frank? He said, yes. I told him, there's no one I will turn to for advice except you because you are the chairman and you know this institute better than anybody else. But if you intervene now, people will bypass the director. He not only agreed with me, he encouraged me to find a solution myself. Now that is why when he gave up being chairman, after I had completed three and a half out of my five year term, I felt extremely depressed. I sincerely wished at that time that CTK had continued as chairman until I completed my term, but that's another story. Now this uh, candor which he encouraged was reflected in several other ways. I don't want to repeat more examples of it. Let me turn to something else. He had an uncanny way of knowing which among his colleagues in the faculty was not producing adequate amount of work. And he would tell me, just give them a nudge, give them a problem to work on. That is the kind of uh, gentle but persuasive advocacy he pursued. Now let me talk about his institution building capacities in another direction, namely the establishment and the initial progress of the Malcolm and Elizabeth Adishashaya Trust. It was a great learning experience for me to be associated as director with the early work of the m and &E Trust. Later on, I was taken as a trustee, a capacity in which I continue even today. It was a wonderful learning experience to de devise protocols for the Malcolm and Elizabeth Adishashaya uh, Trust, its award, especially the Malcolm and Elizabeth Award for Distinguished Contributions to Development Studies, Later on, the Trust added one more, the Elizabeth Archishia Citation for Younger Scholars. It was wonderful to work with CTK in respect of all these uh, activities. The Trust also does several other activities which I will not mention because of paucity of time. Now, CTK, true to his beliefs and to his innate, uh, what shall I say, uh, almost self-effacing personality, decided to step down from the chairmanship of the m and &E &E Trust. We reluctantly agreed. Later on, he said he wants to give up even being a trustee because of his inability to travel from Bangalore, where he was then based, to Chennai. It is only because of intense persuasion from people like Professor Selvaraj and myself that he continued to be a trustee. Now, to the end of his days, except when reading became extremely difficult for him, CTK never gave up his lifelong pursuit at trying to find answers to India's basic problems and towards making economics a socially purposeful discipline. And the finest works he has produced, in my view, are, of course, the number of books he has produced on, 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 on the economy, and of course, the last one, which is a splendid introduction to economics called Real Life Economics. What tribute can we pay CTK except to say, CTK, we shall always treasure your memory. Thank you for enabling us to become close to you. <clears throat> now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. C. Selvaraj. Uh, who is the chairman of the Malcolm and Elizabeth Adisheshia Trust. He is also the secretary of the Madras Christian College Alumni Association. Dr. Nalini Rajan, the Dean of ACG, distinguished fellow speakers, 
ladies and gentlemen dr ctk to me means so much because right from a very uh, raw undergraduate student he has mentored my progress so we have gathered here to celebrate the life and achievements of dr siti kurian my most uh, revered teacher head of the department research supervisor founder trustee of uh, malcolm elizabeth arsish trust most distinguished alumnus of mcc and above all a noble individual of high idealism and righteous deeds i have worked with him in different capacities and he was my invaluable mentor who molded my career dr ctk has taught in the department of economics from the mid 50s to 1978 he belongs to the illustrious lineage of luminaries such as dr malcolm adesheshia dr k n raj dr raja chellaya professor heeli dr chandrashekar who was the then union minister and the list goes on he was a highly respected teacher known for his scholarly lectures i came to know him only in my final ba when he returned from the yale university and started taking undergraduate classes which was not the usual thing for heads of departments to do at the time they meet only the masters course but dr kurian made it a point that he will meet any one of the undergraduate courses later on he made it a point to meet each undergraduate class at least for one hour a week so he taught me the russian economic development in the third year and as the previous speakers have mentioned he was an exacting teacher and it is unbelievable in hindsight i wonder how he managed to do it to teach a class of 65 and odd students russian economic development using morris dob as the basic book and he made us work through it and he made us to write papers using that book and corrected those papers of 65 students every fortnight he had time for everything i have not come across ctk telling students or anyone that he has no time he had time for everyone and any paper you give him any writing you give him it comes back with detailed comments on the left margin and he returns to you in in time so that is that is how i first came into contact with dr kurian and his lectures on russian economic development and in my masters course he taught the advanced economic theory he was a very strong theory teacher so fresh from yale and stanford training he was very adept with advanced e- economic theories like the arrow de brew uh, systems the welfare theorems and general equilibrium models and he used to teach with such ease and mastery we felt that you don't have to go to any foreign university to learn because here was a professor who can teach as good as or better than any university professor in a foreign country so that was his mastery over theory at the same time he used to tell us that we must be alive to the problems that goes around us he will tell us 
to identify the decision makers in the economy. As Dr. V.K. Ramachandran said, who is producing, what is being produced, for whom it is produced. So the neoclassical theory was preoccupied with allocation and he was deeply um, convinced that allocation is not as much a problem as the distribution is. And once we asked him, what is actually economics is all about? He, his answer was an anecdote that the answer given by his professor, Professor Subramaya, who was a senior professor, he was teacher to Dr. CTK. When CTK asked Professor Subramaya, what is economics? Subramaya said, replied, get out. Dr. CTK was fab. Then he realized the meaning that get, go out of the classroom and see for yourself what is going on in the system. That is what economics is all about. So he was running parallel tracks. One, he was his professional duty of teaching advanced economic theory. At the same time, motivating students to analyze problems that are uh, contemporary in, in the economy. Therefore, this penchant for empiricism was always there. And um, he used to tell us the resolving the dilemma between rigor and relevance in economics. And he was fully aware that the philosophy of social sciences has to examine this issue of rigor and relevance by looking at the, in his own words, concepts and constructs of economics against a given paradigm in, <clears throat> in our times. He impressed upon us the importance of theorizing rather than studying only theories. And the stylized facts of orthodox theory do not really let us examine the dynamics of the economic system. Therefore, he made serious efforts to initiate his students in this task of researching into economic issues. And he, as a teacher, he did many innovations. One innovation was that in the early 70s, he started a class called workshop class for the second uh, MA master's class, weekly once. And each student had to present a short paper on what he or she thinks is the problem. And this paper, the entire faculty and the class sat together and deliberated on that paper. And we used to have some of the uh, brilliant presentations made by those who have good language communication or insights of those who had language difficulties. All, all of them presented good papers and this equipped the students. Uh, he used to mention this in the testimonial that he gives at the end of the course that we did a project and this workshop classes used to go on regularly and he found time to be present for every uh, workshop class. And then when he uh, also, he, uh, when the rural problems are going on, he used to bring a group of farmers, bankers, and all stakeholders to sit with the students and discuss. So we get to uh, know from them what are the issues that are confronting the farmers. And another way of his um, uh, you know, mentoring the students is to bring certain leading personalities. We had the good fortune of listening to T.T. Krishnamachari, a former finance minister and uh, alumnus of the department. The first three finance ministers, the alumnus of the department. But we were fortunate to listen to T.T. Krishnamachari, who was living next to the MCC campus. He used to come and uh, give series of lectures to the MA classes. And Mr. R. Venkatraman, 
former president of India, a leading trade union leaders and so on. He, his theme was challenge of the 70s. So he used to bring these people and uh, we had a good exposure and then developed a certain interest for the subject. So the <clears throat> when I joined the teaching, um, CTK never used to tell us what to do, but knowing the kind of tradition that he established in the department, I, ha I had to work within the scope of this tradition, and that made me uh, a teacher that, that, um, that, that is shaped by Dr. Kurian's uh, approach. So it is um, uh, axiomatic that great works of uh, eminent intellectuals have small beginnings or significant beginnings. Dr. Kurian's research efforts and research publications that our distinguished speakers are mentioning all had certain building blocks. And these were small works that he did in the late 60s along with other professors in the college. And probably all this had a cumulative effect on his publications. I see a certain parallel between Dr. Kurian and uh, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes ceased to be a neoclassical and became Keynesian after late 1920s. Similarly, Dr. Kurian also shifted from the neoclassical to the development studies. And Keynes in his uh, introduction to general theory says, it's a natural evolution in the line of thought. So one needs a certain change like this. Because Dr. CTK's early phase was noted for small micro research projects called Thambaram studies. These Thambaram studies, in collaboration with Dr. Gifts Romani, who was another legendary professor who did a lot of work in Mahabalipuram sculptures, these Thambaram studies took up small issues like the informal sector in Thambaram, traders in Thambaram, and uh, I think the uh, department should have these small reports. And these Thambaram studies gave a picture of the socioeconomic challenges faced by the subaltern segment of our community. From this, he progressed towards publishing books such as the Theoretical Approaches to Indian Economy, the William Mayer Endowment Lecture in Madras University, had three lectures brought into book, Theoretical Approaches to Indian Economy, and also his book on the macro analysis of Indian economic crisis, which talks about uh, taxonomy of household savings and uh, uh, borrowing. Actually, it came from the household savings survey that one of these Thambaram studies have, have accomplished. Realizing that uh, research scholars need a course in research methodology, he conducted an All India workshop in the early 1970s, I think it is 1972, when methodology course was unknown at the time. Lectures given by leading resource persons. He brought in statisticians, social scientists, together, economists, and uh, gave a series of lectures. And then he published this proceedings as a book, A Guide to Research Methodology in Economics, later. And uh, one of the distinguishing features of this book is the first chapter on introduction. I have not come across such an analytical presentation of the philosophy of method uh, so far as any similar publication is concerned. A most uh, distinctive feature of his publication is that they are easy to grasp and understand without the embellishment of what uh, Dr. Suresh Popa mentioned about modeling, embellishment of quantitative analysis. 
Since Dr. CTK was essentially an institutional economist, he was more interested in substantive issues that confront the economy. While reviewing his book on wealth and ill-fare, the Hindu wrote, thus I quote, Korean takes us deep into the functioning of the Indian economy without having to encounter obstacles of economic jargons or even unnecessary statistical details. He takes on board concepts as and when he needs them, presenting them to the reader with a matter of fact simplicity and clarity. This sums up his approach to um, analysis of problems and presenting his analysis. And this is the style he taught us in our research work to be precise, lucid, and clear. And the quantitative side of our research uh, is, is only uh, uh, aiding our uh, logic, but not uh, a substitute. I would be incomplete if I don't say that. What is his signal contribution to the Department of Economics? Not only the um, uh, you know, micro studies or seminars or uh, methodology courses. But from 1968 onwards, he has been uh, having freewheeling discussion among the faculty, among the students about what could be an alternative curriculum for undergraduates in economics. And this discussion used to take place almost once in a term or twice in a term. And the, as a department faculty and as a student at the time, later in the 70s I was in the department, we used to participate and it used to have uh, some differences, sharp division among uh, the groups. But we were the, the, he initiated a process of thinking about new curriculum. And in 1975-76, Dr. Malcolm Adesashia's BC of Madras University took the step of introducing the institutions called autonomous colleges, first time in the country. And this autonomous college autonomy means a synthesis of the three processes of education, the instruction, the curriculum design, the instruction, and examination. All these are integrated. In the university affiliation system, all these three processes are disjointed. And therefore, Dr. Adesheshev felt that academic autonomy is essential for educational uh, attainment, and the colleges must have the freedom to devise their own curriculum and teach it and examine the students on their own. So we were fortunate to get that autonomy status. And Dr. Kurian, because he has done the background work for the you know, five, six years before this, could easily move into this. And he prepared a structure of new curriculum and published it in the EPW for wider national consultation and debate. And we got uh, support from persons, none, uh, person none other than Joan Robinson, uh, Professor Krishna Bharadwaj, Professor Kantar Anadivi, Dr. V.K.R. Virav, Dr. K.N. Raj. So our confidence was bolstered and we could work on the content. And this is the, uh, in my opinion, this is the most important contribution that Dr. Korean made for the student community, for the faculty of MCC. And as an administrator, CTK was one of the most important uh, uh, administrators in the college. He guided the decision-making process of MCC. And uh, he was Dean of Humanities, member of the Senators, convener of Finance Committee, and so on. But what is most uh, attractive uh, aspect is that everyone had the awe and respect 
to his presence in a particular committee and they accepted his prescription or suggestion whatever it is whenever a difficult situation arises and recognizing his academic achievement and his contribution to the alma mater the mcc alumni association honored him with distinguished alumnus award in 2016 and uh, <clears throat> the citation read as mr ram mentioned the citation mentioned that he was a public intellectual and contributed so much to the academic field and the alma mater and as founder trustee he guided the he has he guided the uh, malcolm and elizabeth adesia trust till the end and he used to attend meetings and uh, offer his comments and um, his presence always gave us a certain psychological support even on july 2nd when i spoke to him um, he was sounding very tired and but he was inquiring about the trust and the matters and then he said he is tired and he wants to sleep little did i realize that in few days time he will go into uh, the eternal sleep so dr kurian an iconic teacher able administrator a model social scientist and an uncompromising public intellectual is no more but he has left behind rich repertoire knowledge that successive generations of students and researchers could bank upon so i would like to end by quoting a tirukural couplet irumai vagai therindu kon eendu arap poondar perumai pirangitru ulagu that is the discerning and the righteous will brighten and glorify the world in a large measure thank you <clears throat> thank you very much uh, dr selvaraj we now have another video of uh, professor k uh, nagaraj who is a former professor of the madras institute of development studies and also he's adjunct faculty of the asian college of journalism Professor C.T. Kurian recruited me as a junior faculty in MIDS in 1979, and it turned out to be an opportune moment for me to join the institute, at least for two reasons. During the 70s and the 80s, the Indian Council of Social Science Research, under the visionary leadership of people like uh, Dia Gadgil. Jipar Sarthi and people like that had seen the need for social science research to be decentralized in a diverse country like India, and was in the process of setting up a number of research institutes in social sciences in different parts of the country, and MIDS was one of them. In fact, MIDS was recognized. as an icssr research institute in 1978 just about a year before i joined mids in that sense i've been in mids i was in mids almost right from the beginning of the institution and i was there during the formative years secondly malcolm arishesia and city kurian the founding fathers of the institute as it were had set the ethos for the institute they had set the ethos and had fostered it and it is this ethos which was the responsible some sense so for what the institute was In fact, almost right from the beginning, even during its formative years, uh, CTK hired a number of youngsters like me, and what is more important, that uh, 
He, in fact, gave us complete freedom, freedom in terms of the topic that we would like to work on, freedom in terms of uh, uh, the perspective that we would adopt, freedom in terms of the methodology that we would employ. So this freedom, in some sense, was uh, the hallmark of MITS. Freedom even for youngsters like us at that time. Secondly, uh, Professor Kurian saw to it that the institution was, uh, in some sense, a multidisciplinary institution. Okay. It was not just the economists who were recruited by him. There were there were sociologists, anthropologists, then uh, historians, then political scientists. So we had people, particularly editors from diverse fields in social sciences. And thirdly, we can also sort of that the institute doesn't stay an ivory tower. Uh, in fact, we tried to for, forge strong academic links with uh, a number of other research institutions and uh, universities and university and college departments in social sciences, not just in Tamil Nadu, but mostly in different parts of South India. And towards this end, in fact, a number of programs were started in ideas. Uh, the uh, prime example of that is, in fact, uh, the research scholars workshop with the Institute conducted in ideas annually, and then took it to different parts of South India to different uh, universities and uh, colleges. Okay, so uh, uh, the so while we had a good deal of freedom, we had complete freedom in terms of what we wanted to work on. The uh, Atmosphere in the institute was also said that most of us, in fact, ended up working on certain concrete issues uh, on the developmental problems in Tamil Nadu from different perspectives, from different disciplinary backgrounds, and things like that. So, a good deal of work on, on say, Tamil Nadu economy society got done. In would impact on it. So that in uh, MID has become, in some sense, the go to place for almost anything on Tamil Nadu economy and society. All in all, I would say, based on my personal experience there for about 30 years, it was a very lively place, uh, very liberal, very democratic, and there is there was a considerable amount of work that got done in the institution. Okay. Uh, and it was a very nice place in that sense to work. And, uh, now, I won't say that everything was perfect and there was no problem in the institution. Of course, there were problems. Okay. Part of the reason was also that uh, we were a bunch of youngsters very argumentative, how to change the world, had very strong views and, uh, uh, you know, wanted our way very often. And uh, that would also mean that we crossed the limits and the lines once in a while. But whenever something like that happened, there was always the presence of uh, Siti Kurian and Malcolm Adhisheshaya, their presence as well as their helping hand 
in some sense to set things right. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, speaking personally, in terms of my personal experience, Malcolm and CTK were a presence as well as an example. Okay. Uh, their discipline, their work ethic, their you know, commitment to the institution as well as to the society at large, okay. uh, their simplicity, their honesty, okay. these are all qualities worth emulating, but very difficult to emulate on a consistent basis in some sense. Again, you know, talking personally or from my personal experience, uh, every now and then I would try to emulate these qualities. I would uh, like to have their discipline and uh, work ethic. But uh, then facts of life would intervene and would relapse back to my normal self. But when this happened, far too often, or it was far too visible, there was always the gentle guide, guiding hand of the CTK to remind me, you know. Uh, in fact, he would call me whenever something like that happened when I hadn't produced enough of good quality research over a period of time, he would call me and tell me, look, Nagraj, uh, like something like, look, Nagraj, uh, uh, you have done considerable amount of work on, say, agriculture. Uh, but I have a feeling there is not enough work on the issue of urbanization in Tamil Nadu. Why would you try that? In fact, you could try to see whether there are any linkages between the process of urbanization on the one hand and the agrarian context on the other. Or he would call me and tell me, uh, look, Nagraj, the International Labor Organization has approved the institute to conduct a study, a small study on uh, employment and employment situation in uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, would you like to do that? Uh, now, these were not impositions, these were very gentle report. Uh, but uh, there was no way I could say no. Uh, anyway, uh, all in all, I would say that uh, even though there were problems, the uh, fact that a uh, considerable amount of work got done in it, in fact, was, a, was an antidote which is to that particular problem. Let me end by pointing out an, uh, an important issue regarding, say, the autonomy of the institute. When the ICSSR set up these institutions, including, say, my it wanted these institutions to have autonomy. You know, I think that was a very visionary thing to do. Now, even though these are ICSSR institutes, each one had an autonomy. And the autonomy, at least in the case of MIDS, in some sense, provide foundational basis for what it was, for the um, type of freedom we all had, the faculty, or the type of work that was getting done, okay, the type of ethos that was built up over a period of time. All this was possible because it had that autonomy. And both City Korean and Malcolm Avishishya guarded this autonomy very jealously. Uh, now, one should also note that for a small institution like this, like MIDS, which always worked on a shoestring budget, always short of resources, and is almost completely dependent on state funding for its functioning, okay? Guarding this autonomy is a, an onerous task, okay? But it has to be guarded. And uh, both CTK and Malcolm, as I pointed out, guarded it very jealously. Okay. 
and uh, I am sure that uh, the um, present faculty and the present administration will also see the need for guarding its autonomy and that they'll be up to the task and guarding it, its autonomy, guarding the work of the institutional ethos that was built up over a period of time by these two founding fathers, I think this would be the best tribute that we would pay to Professor Siti Kurian as well as to Professor Malka Maharishi Sheikh. Thank you very much. So finally, I uh, have pleasure, great pleasure in inviting Dr. A.R. Venkata Chalapati, who's a professor in the Madras Institute of Development Studies. Uh, much of what I wanted to say has been covered by the earlier speakers. But as somebody belonging to a completely different generation, I want to make some observations in paying my tribute to Professor Siti Kurian. Uh, I am jealous of some of the people on the podium and also in the audience because I was not fortunate to have teachers like uh, Siti Kurian. I studied a very soft discipline in my undergrad. I was a BCom graduate. Then I did correspondence course for my MA. So I, until I actually went to JNU, I didn't see anybody, a great teacher in flesh and blood. And therefore, I'm very jealous to see that so many in this particular hall had the privilege of being taught by CT Korean in their undergraduate class. Very clearly, he was a legendary teacher. And much of it was in evidence during the course of my interaction, even though I met him only more or less after his retirement. One of my early memories of him was him speaking at the launch of the Tamil translation of his dynamics of rural transformation in Tamil Nadu. This was probably in 1988 or 89 that uh, his book was translated into Tamil and he was present in, the, in that particular book launch and he spoke very clearly on that occasion. I remember that very clearly. I think I would continue with what my former colleague and friend, uh, Professor K. Nagaraj, said about the institution that he built. I'm a, personally, I'm a beneficiary of the kind of institution that he built. That is an institution which has great academic and functional autonomy. In that sense, I think I'm more privileged than others because I've had I've had the fortune or misfortune of having taught at at least two universities where academic autonomy was a very scarce product. So MIDS has provided at least three generations of scholars with great amount of academic freedom. Scholars who started as economists ended up as social theorists, as cultural historians. So this kind of uh, enabling intellectual atmosphere was a creation of both Malcolm Adi Seshaya and CTK Korean. But in building this institution, CTK did it without seeking power. We know that Malcolm Adi Seshaya in those days was on the search committee of practically every university's vice chancellor search committees. And, uh, CTK could easily have become a vice chancellor, but he consciously chose not to take up vice chancellorships. Instead, he built an institution, and as, he has, as some of the former speakers mentioned, he decided, along with Malcolm, not to go for established scholars, but to invest in new scholars. And everybody would agree that given the reputation that MIDS has made, especially in the first two generations, that his, this particular gambit paid off. Uh, he not only built the institution, we also have to remember 
that for many years, for almost I think 15 years or so, he was the only PhD supervisor in uh, MIDS. So he trained uh, many, many students. And uh, I've seen at least uh, two of his last students submitting their PhDs. One was, I think his name was Thomas from, uh, Thompson, Thompson from uh, Cochin Technological University or something. And the last student was uh, Jay Ranjan. I could see that, you know, the the kind of uh, stress under which they worked, trying to meet not just the standards that were set by CTK, but also the standards that these PhD scholars themselves set for themselves because they were still students of CT Korean. So I could, I could very clearly uh, see that. And also one of my early friends and uh, mentors, Pandian's PhD thesis, which I read in a cyclostyle form, I distinctly remember him telling me that, you know, CTK made him write his conclusion seven times. And finally, Pandian apparently told him that, you know, I can't do this anymore. And then CTK apparently told him that I wanted to get the best out of it, and I think I've done it. So to kind of sum up, you know, I want to talk about a few of his uh, exemplary qualities. You know, this was a life of scholarship. This was a life of the mind. Uh, it remains one of, you know, the old generation of, you know, academic monks. You know, that is the image one has of, uh, of uh, CTK. You know, by my generation or just my generation before mine, you know, academics started wearing designer clothes and started zipping around in cars. I have always seen him, you know, dressed very simply. I have seen him uh, use a bicycle, an old bicycle, even when he was director of MIDS. He was a uh, he was meticulous in everything. I have uh, had correspondence with him when he was director, uh, when he was uh, the editor of uh, Review and uh, Develop Review of Development and Ch uh, Change, which is an MIDS journal. He founded the journal. So when he invited me to write book reviews, I had occasion to interact with him. Always when you wrote to him, he would respond immediately. This was a trait that continued till the end, until the last years. None of our letters would go unacknowledged. So he was meticulous in that. He was a seeker of knowledge. So when he retired, he I met him on the last day of his chairpersonship at MIDS. So he said that I am going to stop doing my academic work, but I will continue to read and I will do regular book reviews. He kept to that promise and he wrote regularly in the front line, long detailed reviews as it was mentioned earlier. He would always present as objectively as possible the arguments of the authors and only then make us interventions. And he also said he had one uh, dream which he wanted to realize uh, in retirement. He said when he left Stanford, he had bought the full set of Will and Ariel Durant's Story of Civilization. He said, I have not read it, now I want to read it. And when I saw him subsequently in various meetings, I would inquire about the progress and he would say that, you know, I finished the first volume, now I'm into the second volume. And then uh, also his search for seeking for knowledge. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to edit the uh, work of Dilip Veer Raghavan, you know, Suresh Babu's uh, colleague at IIT. Uh, the book was about the Kulakal Vithitam of 1952-54. The book is called, published by Left Word. It was called Half a Day for Cast. So it had references to CT Korean. I sent the book to Professor CTK and promptly within a week, he read the book and he wrote back to me. Then another aspect of it, of him was that, you know, his, he was not only simple, but he was a, uh, marked by humility and he had no rancor. Some years before the pandemic, probably in, 2015 or 2016, he wrote a memoir of his days at 
MIDs. Uh, this memoir, I think, is probably about uh, 25 pages. You know, it is marked by great humility. You know, great amount of self-effacement. He is not claiming any special credit for building the institution. He gives uh, due credit to all his colleagues and also his rivals. I understand here, yeah, you know, there were some big titans in MIDS. It was not the time of pygmies like me in those days, but obviously held his own. And even in narrating those experiences, he, there is no rancor in what he wrote. And finally, I would want to say something about his integrity. So in the, uh, the mid-first uh, decade of the 21st century, between 2005 and 2007, MIDS had some very serious institutional problems. And in that situation, you know, the governing council was vertically divided. And at that time, I was also part of the governing council. And uh, at that point, the situation was very difficult and one had to take a position. And after deep consideration, I talked to Professor Kurian and asked him, what should I do? He could have easily said, you know, since I am the one who built the institute, I was the chairperson when, I, when you were appointed as assistant professor and associate professor, you should just tow my line. He could have easily said that. But he said only one thing. He said, you decide and take a decision which you think is right. And there ended the conversation. Nowhere during the many uh, turbulent and tempestuous meetings that were held in the governing council, he never turned to anyone in the uh, council seeking support because he was the one who built the institute. He would make his argument and rest his case. So these are all some of the qualities that I greatly admire and I hope some of it can be imbibed. It would always be my lasting regret that I did not know Professor CTK in his heydays, but I have been fortunate to work with many of those who were his students, who were his colleagues, who were his uh, mentees, and I joined them in paying my tribute to a remarkable and exemplary man who lived a very full and productive life. Thank you very much.